Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Darien Library and the Museum of Darien in this evening's program, History Close to Home, Darien 1820, New Town, New Times, with author and historian Ken Reese. Ken will be diving into the, into the town's past and discover how Darien gains its independence from Stanford in 1820. Before we begin, I would like to mention that programs like this, as well as our collection, are made possible by the Friends of the Annual, sorry, the Annual Friends of the Library Campaign. We thank you for your support to make programs like this, as well as our collections, available to the community. And now I would like to welcome the Executive Director of the Museum of Jerry Ann, Maggie McIntyre. Hi, Amanda, thank you so much. The Museum of Darien is thrilled to be partnering with the Darien Library for this and other history close to home programs. Our special guest this evening will soon be transporting all of us to Darien of 1820, so it seems like an opportune time to take a moment and give everyone a quick update about what is happening with the town's official bicentennial celebrations. After a hugely successful opening ceremony in January of 2020, the remaining official bicentennial events were put on hold due to COVID. But thanks to the persistence of the town's 2020 Bicentennial Committee, chaired by museum board member Al Miller, and thanks also to the continued support of the very generous 2020 sponsors, we have rescheduled the next three town celebrations for later this year under the careful guidance of town officials and in particular, the town's health department. Also a quick Quick couple of notes on two of the committee's bicentennial projects. The Darien Library is heading up the time capsule project and a quick reminder that the deadline for submissions is June 1st. And also thanks to a generous grant from the Darien Foundation, we are moving forward with the Bicentennial Heritage Trail project. All of these plans are being finalized right now and we hope you can join us in 2021 for 2020 one more time. Details will be coming soon on the town's official 2020 webpage. <clears throat> so please visit that site for information. And while you're there, please do take note of our official 2020 sponsors and give these local businesses a big thank you when you visit. And now on to our main event this evening. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce tonight the Museum of Darien historian Ken Reese as he answers our questions about his new book, Darien 1820, New Town, New Times, here it is. Ken is joining us this evening from the Museum Schofield Barn Exhibition Center, where as you can see in the background, uh, there's a bit of the accompanying Darien 1820 exhibit, which he co-curated with board member and curator Lynn Shepard. Ken Reese's lifelong pursuit of history has in recent years been sharply focused on the story of Darien, Connecticut, where he has made his home for the past 32 years. In addition to his most recent work to commemorate the town's bicentennial, Ken is also the author of the, here it is, <laughs> The Story of Darien, Connecticut, The Definitive History of the Town, which by the way, can be purchased uh, here at the museum or at Barrett Bookstore and um, can be loaned uh, or borrowed at Darien Library. As the history historian of the Museum of Darien, Ken has served on its board of directors for many years and as its president for four years. He has delivered numerous lectures and curated dozens of displays and ex exhibits at the museum, including our current exhibition, Darien 1820. Ken graduated from the University of Connecticut and after a career of editing and publishing business magazines, he and his wife, Sylvia Reese, started a business together selling antique prints, maps, and ephemera. Together, they helped found the Antiques Council. On a personal note, uh, I would just like to add that uh, myself, uh, all of us here at the Museum of Darien, and in fact, the entire town owes Ken a debt of great gratitude. He is not only our go-to source of all things having to do with Darien's history, he is known throughout the entire region and the state as the most fervent ambassador of Darien's history, and he truly delights in educating all ages about this town's fascinating past. It has been a true delight working here at the museum with Ken, and so it is my honor and delight to introduce Museum of Darien historian, Ken Reese, as he discusses Darien of 1820. Thank you, Ken. Well, thank you, Maggie. That's uh, far more than I deserve. 
but I really appreciate the ful fulsomeness of your introduction. Uh, I think that we are fortunate indeed that we are finally at last able to come out of the, the COVID wilderness and get back into some of our 2020 uh, celebrations. And I, th I think that this really handsome exhibit and, and uh, programs like this are gonna go a long way toward making that real. Thank you, Ken. Your new book and the subject of Museum of Darien's major exhibition, ex I can't talk tonight, I'm sorry, <laughs> exhibition, Darien 1820, commemorates the town's bicentennial by tracing this town's path to independence. What is it about Darien's origin story that really stands out, especially compared to surrounding towns? Well, I think the 1820 aspect of it is really very important to me. I mean, most of the other towns became uh, chartered as towns all in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And they went straight from being parishes to being towns. And in fact, they, it was such an easy transition that there were the places in which the annual parish meeting and the annual town meeting were the same time and the minutes were kept in the same book. Uh, here, the parish system had, by 1820, the parish system had taken a real hit because the state, the new state constitution dis disestablished the congregational church as the official religious organization of the state of Connecticut. So the parish had just reverted to being uh, ecclesiastical parishes. And when we became a town, we basically had to start right at the bottom and, and build a town uh, with all of the town structure uh, separate from that parish that, that uh, we had been before. Okay. Um, my next question is a bunch of questions all in one big question, Ken. <laughs> no, sorry about this. So, okay. Right. So here it goes. Would you personally want to live in Darien in 1820? Can you give us a feeling for some of the sights, sounds, and smells um, we might encounter while walking down the country road in 1820? What things would we recognize in Darien of 1820? And what would be unrecognizable to a person living here today? So that's a lot of questions all at once. The first one was, would you personally want to live here? Compared to not living anywhere or compared to living someplace else? Uh, um, compared to living today. Compared to today, no. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm very content with today, thank you very much. Uh, but if I had to be living anywhere in 1820, this would be a good place to do it, I think. Um, and then uh, you were talking about what would we be seeing, what would it be like, uh, and you mentioned smells. And uh, I imagine that most of the town smelled like a farm. And we all know what farms smell like, I hope. Uh, my grandmother used to say it's a nice clean smell, but I don't know where she got that idea. Uh, <clears throat> but there were animals everywhere, animals, the uh, farm animals, uh, animals on the roads, uh, and they left a certain um, aroma behind them. But you got used to it, I'm sure. And you know what? I think if we lived there for a while and then came back here, we would notice some uh, really noxious uh, odors from I-95 and uh, the, the cars and trucks and whatever around us. So I, I can't imagine in the final analysis, it would be much worse one way or the other. Now, as far as, as what would one see, what would one feel, you know, um, very little of, the old country road, which is our old King's Highway. Uh, very little of that would look familiar, except the route, uh, the route that we would follow then, we would follow now. Uh, we would see uh, when you came to uh, Goodwives River Road, for example, uh, you would see that that would have a nice wide uh, angle to enter it so that you could get the wagons down there easily. And, and that would be right where it is today. And that would seem familiar and a lot of other roads the same way. 
the one thing that you would notice uh, that would be really kind of amazing would be that new highway that went through town and really cut the town in half, was long and straight and wide and smooth, and they called it the Connecticut Turnpike, and today we call it the Post Road, and it hasn't moved an inch either way. It's right where they put it in 1870, so that would look familiar to us anyway. I, can I point out, can I just follow up with something, Ken? I, I love how you pointed out a couple times that a, a person coming here, if they could time travel or something from medieval times, would recognize more about the town showing up in Darien of 1820 than we would going back to 1820. Well, that, of course, yeah, that, um, I think that's a very important uh, uh, aspect of this. You can't sit here today and peel back enough layers to get yourself back to 1820. It just doesn't happen uh, because there's nothing left. You don't know what you're doing. Essentially, you almost have to take yourself back to the Middle Ages or back to the uh, uh, caveman days almost and build on that and see what you have when you get to 1820. Uh, it, it was uh, Henry Adams, the historian and grandson of presidents, uh, who said that the, um, the, the, the farmer of, basically said that the farmers of, eight, of the year 800 uh, in, uh, in, in Sa the Saxon farmers of 800 would have absolutely no trouble adjusting to life in 1800. Uh, in uh, in America, because the farm the farms really hadn't changed that much. The procedures hadn't changed. The the the, the equipment, the animals, the uh, husbandry was very and and the life uh, was really much more similar to that than it is to today. Someone wants to know um, when you know if we were to choose a town to live in at that time, why would Darien be better or different than other places around here? Why would be Darien be better or different? Well, it would be different. Uh, one reason it would be different, it would be, I think, a bit more cosmopolitan than some of the more inland towns. Uh, Darien was, was not really ever uh, a, 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 a Puritan town. Uh, yes, the Congregational Church, which was the Puritan Church, uh, was the largest uh, religious body in town, but I don't think they ever had more than 40, 42% of the town as members. Uh, the uh, Church of England by the Revolutionary War, Church of England had probably 30% of the population and the, and the rest of them either uh, had no religious affiliation or had one really very much at arm's length. So it was not that um, New England, um, you know, really starchy uh, Puritan town that you read about uh, at all. And it, it was, uh, I think, uh, uh, because we were part of Stanford uh, and part of Norwalk also, uh, it uh, had a, a, a lot more juice to it than some of the ones that were pretty far inland. And another question popped in. Can you talk about um, you know, what people were cooking at that time and even just the act of cooking, what that looked like? That's an interesting question, Amanda, because it's, it's changing. It's changing very rapidly. See, that's one of the nice things about 1820 also is that there is just so much change going on. Now, it's not, it's not all in a rush. Uh, the way we do it today, but it was it was creeping up on us. Um, <clears throat> first thing that you would see is that in many of the houses, particularly the newer houses that had been built since 1800, the fireplaces were much smaller than the old ones from the 1700s. It, you didn't have the walk-in fireplace anymore. And they had moved the ovens out of the back of the fireplace and put it next to the fireplace, these beehive ovens that you could bake in. Now, even after the fireplaces stopped being used for most of the cooking, 
people for years and years and years, well into the mid 1800s, continued to use those beehive ovens because once you learned how to do them, they were absolutely wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> there are ads, and we show one in the book, there are ads coming out now uh, as you get to 1820 for those newfangled iron stoves. And you would basically run the stovepipe under the, up the chimney, uh, but you could actually have the fire in the stove and cook on the stove uh, and not uh, worry about setting your skirts on fire or tipping the, the, the boiling water over on your feet or something like that. And uh, I don't know how fast they moved in, but it never, it never turned back once, once that hit. And I have another question before I move on to my official question. Can you talk about um, the schools in town then, where they were located? The schools? Mm -hmm. um, the schoolhouse was the original and the main schoolhouse was next to the old meeting house, the old congregational church. And I believe, it, you know, right by the congregational church, there's a triangular parking lot up on the same level as the church. I believe that is where the schoolhouse was located, was in that triangle. Uh, <clears throat> uh, now, additional schoolhouses, I am not entirely sure what, when the next one was built. Now, I do know, though, that, uh, kids who lived more in the southwestern part of town would uh, cross the river and go into Norwalk for school, uh, into what we call Rowayton now. Uh, and um, probably uh, others perhaps went into Stanford when you get up, uh, uh, oh, up, up um, Hoyt Streets more, uh, you could cross over uh, into Stanford there. Uh, the next, the next school probably would have been down near Five Mile River. Down there, there was one very, very early uh, that became Hindley, down across uh, uh, Norton uh, Avenue from um, uh, the present Hindley, the, where the vacant lot is now. That was a school very, very early in the early 1800s. So that would have been a, that would have been there as well. But of course, you didn't have to go to school. You know, that was school, school attendance was never required. The only obligation of a parent was to teach a child to uh, read and write sufficiently to be able to read the public notices and sign your name. So. Um, I feel like I have a lot of follow-up questions, but I know we have to move on to other ones. <laughs> My question Amanda, for you. Amanda, I is, wonder if, we, uh, if can we switch that one and go to the next one down? Um, oh, about, sure. I think that that might be more interesting. And I think I know okay. the answer to that one. Okay. If you were able to time travel back to town during that year, whom would you like to most meet? Uh, I know that this is uh, sacrilegious, I've, but I'm not going to say uh, that I would like to see. Um, our, our, our friend, Mr. Bell. Um, I mean, I would like to, that would be fine. But the one that I would really be searching for uh, would be Selleck Jones. And Selleck Jones was one of the merchants down at the landing. Now he had inherited that business in 1814 when his father, Isaac Jones died. Isaac was a, one of the Revolutionary War whaleboat captains and he'd been in that store business for a long time. And um, I would love to find out, Selleck Jones himself uh, went into the business by, by being, captaining the, the uh, trading boat that went into New York City, taking the produce in and, and bringing uh, orders and, and inventory and stuff back out. I'd love to know how that worked, just how that, how that happened and how it worked. And I'd love to go into his, his storehouse or store, maybe I guess, I guess they were calling them stores by then, and see what they were actually selling and see what they inventoried uh, and whether or not they displayed it and how that worked. And uh, because those are all questions I still have and I don't know how to find out, find the answers except by going back and asking Sell it. 
Ken, can I just follow up with something? Didn't you um, talk about how the word store came about? Yeah. Um, what, can you just mention that? Yeah, I mean, if anywhere else in the English speaking world, they're not stores, they're shops. And we call them stores because that was short, because the original, what they were originally here was storehouses. And the merchants would build storehouses and this, the things that you needed to send into New York next week right, with at, at, at the next voyage in would be put in the storehouse until they loaded it on the boat. And then if they <clears throat> were asked to buy certain things for you, they'd put that in the storehouse till you went down and picked it up. And oh, by the way, while they were at it, they knew that some certain number of you were gonna want molasses or rum or, or, or uh, a flour or various necessities. So they would put them in the storehouse too for, for people to buy. Uh, but the storehouse of course became stores. Thank you. Looks like we're getting a bunch of questions coming in. Um, yes, I was gonna move a few. Are you able to talk a bit about the religious affiliations and um, denominations in the area in Connecticut in 1820? Um, yeah, the primary one, of course, was the Congregational, which, as I said before, was the largest in town, but never, well, not at least in the uh, late 18th and early 19th century, was not a majority by any means. The, um, there was some, uh, uh, oh, there was a, a significant Anglican or Episcopalian uh, uh, component because the uh, these uh, society for the propagation of gospel of the gospel in foreign lands, uh, the SPG, uh, came out of London in the mid 1700s very aggressively uh, to try to uh, get as many converts as possible in this country, and it it did succeed. It was quite successful, and there were Anglican churches both in Stamford and in Norwalk. Uh, not in Darien. By, by the late 1700s, early 1800s, um, the Quakers, although they were, their parent organization was in Portchester, but by 1811, they had built a small uh, Quaker meeting uh, on the uh, Turnpike Road, um, right about where the Fireman's Monument is now. And the uh, Methodists were beginning to hold their some services with tra uh, traveling ministers, uh, going kind of to people's houses to, to hold a service from time to time. And the Baptists, there was a Baptist uh, by 1820, there was certainly one, at least one Baptist uh, church in Stamford. Uh, there was one that was way up north, up in uh, in what they call up in Bangal, and another one uh, downtown. And instrumental in found, founding those were uh, Isaac and Eb Ebenezer Jones uh, from here. Uh, in fact, we have uh, some of their organizational documents in our files. But um, that was pretty much, I would think, it. Um, Oh, there was also, as a matter of fact, um, in, New, in New Canaan, um, Benjamin Fitch's father, who was a bit of a whack job, um, very strange man. But anyway, he got involved with the Shakers and he convinced them to start a Shaker colony and a Shaker um, meeting in New Canaan. So there was a Shaker meeting in New Canaan for a while, and then that fell, fell apart. Thank you. Okay, we have a few more. Um, let's see. This person said, by 1820, would all of the land that compromised Darien, um, comprised, sorry, Darien, have been in private hands, or would there have been a common lands for grazing? Um, you know, if a new immigrant came to town, would they have um, purchased property from an existing owner or was there land in public hands that was a porch like um, given to early settlers to farm? They, they, 
they missed the era of the public lands. Uh, the public lands pretty much closed down in the late 1600s and it all went into private hands. One of the issues here, of course, was that, remember, we all know the story of the Connecticut Charter and how the charter was hidden in the oak tree to keep it away from the nasty representatives of the king who wanted to take it back. And the reason they wanted to take it back was there was, there was still a lot of land, public land around that the, <clears throat> would lie, you know, put more money in the king's pocket. Um, if it weren't Connecticut land, it were, uh, it, it, it were uh, the king's land. And um, with that threat coming up, the state and the and Stanford city, uh, town rather, Stanford, Norwalk and others moved very, very swiftly to get as much public land as possible into private hands. So lest that confiscation actually occur. Uh, so there was a great, um, sale and awarding of lands to prominent citizens and so on and so forth in the, in the 1680s. By 1750, um, if you wanted to start a new farm, a substantial, a, a, a new farm of, of some substance and size, uh, you had to leave town. And by 1820, one of the things we talk about is in this, in the census, there's actually a drop in the male population of people who would be in the family forming stages. And I think it's because so many of them had to leave town to uh, go to the other side of the Hudson River, go out into New York State and whatever, where there was lands available. And then, <clears throat> then their, their, their women, their wives would come and join them. And that leveled out the population here again. But uh, no, you. It, it was a fight for land. Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing some. Amanda, are you seeing some on the chat? Um, do you mind if I ask a couple of questions? Yeah, that? sure. That's fine. I know you're popular, Ken. <laughs> I know you're getting a lot of questions. So I love this. Sorry, part. ladies, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what sports would people be playing then, or what fun types of activities would they be doing? Oh my, that's a very good question. Uh, particularly what, what kinds of activities that uh, you could discuss. Um, I think that, I think that they would have, um, there weren't a lot. I mean, there's nothing that necessarily that you did every, you know, every Friday or every day after work or something like that, <clears throat> you were too tired. But um, we, we talk, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, in the book, there's a t talking about after, the, uh, after the, the crops are in in the fall and the, uh, uh, I, think, I think it is that, uh, and the, the, uh, the husking is done, the corn husking is done, uh, then uh, all the farm hands and the, uh, the women of the farm would have a day uh, to go have a picnic at the beach and uh, have a you know a, have a real outing, and that was I think the kind of activity that was very popular. Um, I would not be a bit surprised if uh, there were uh, you know kind of a fiddle and fiddle and some dances for parties after uh, uh, weddings or uh, actually the weddings weren't that weren't that much, but uh, the big the big deal was when you when you finally moved into your house, uh, and that would be a big party. Um, so there was you know parties of that sort of thing. I don't know anything about well oh, by 1820. All right, I'll tell you what the sport was. We were getting up to um, horses. That was probably getting to be the big one, which was. Um, and this was actually was more later on, but once that highway went in, uh, the uh, the boys started having uh, t timing how long it took to get to Stanford, or timing how long it took to you know to get here and there. And my horse is faster than your horse, and they were they were having horse races on the uh, on the highway. Um, but uh, I you know I don't know any other sports that involve bats and balls and things like that that were available then. Okay, thanks. 
Um, so uh, there's a, a, actually one from um, a board member here. Uh, he's uh, of, of the museum. What types of issues concern town leaders the most in 1820? Um, the kinds of things like growing the town's commerce, increasing, maintaining the town's population. And then he asked, was crime an issue of any sort, particularly by the port? I'm sorry, what was the last one, Maggie? Was, was crime an issue of any sort? Uh, not that I have on the crime, not that I have ever encountered. Um, not that I have ever encountered, but then again, uh, I, I couldn't guarantee that it would be written down someplace where I would be able to find it. The, um, what, the, the, the earlier part of that was what now? What, what types of issues most concern? Oh yeah, 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 roads, 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 oh. roads. They had, um, and animals, roads and animals. Yeah. When they when they uh, uh, had their first town meeting, they had a, a, a several surveyors of roads. Now they didn't survey them to you know look at them through little instruments and stuff like that. Not that kind of surveying. Surveying as in uh, you know all I survey. Their job was to watch over certain roads because being they were all dirt roads, of course. And they're largely in lousy shape, but a fallen tree or a, uh, a flooded stream or something could really just wipe those roads out. Uh, and so there was just a constant fight to keep the roads passable. Um, the one of the ones that I loved was uh, the, uh, the, the post road, the new highway uh, that would flood down down in the flats down by um, um, oh down by the Gardner Center and down by the the, uh, the down by the uh, Spring Grove Cemetery it's, where it's very low and that before I probably before that big pond was dug in the cemetery uh, that would flood out in the spring and then at one time um, it caught fire. And there were fires burning down there under the ground uh, because there are peat, uh, there are deposits of peat under the ground and that would catch fire and would burn for months. But um, so the roads were tough. And also the animals, they had uh, I think five or six Haywards, H-A-W-A-R-D, uh, -A -A uh, which are actually Howards. Um, it's an old, <coughs> There was, they weren't look, looking after hay. Uh, it's, it comes from haw, H-A-W, and haws were hedges in Britain. And you had to watch the hedges because the hedges kept the animals in. And when, they, when there was a break in the hedges, the animals would wander. So you, the, the people, and there were no hedges here, but the, we, there were plenty of animals and they would get loose and they would wander. And so <clears throat> catching the animals, the straying animals before they did damage, and uh, penning them up until the owner could be found. That was a major uh, municipal activity. Also, Ken, uh, in your book, you mentioned during the first meeting of, um, after the town gained its independence, uh, they were talking about the roads and the animals, but also there was something called the keeper of the keys that they voted. Yeah, the key keeper, right. The key keeper, right. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of an honorary job uh and i'm you know uh, it, it it came from when the uh and the only meeting place in town continued to be the congregational meeting house so meetings were held there and the town just simply used that as an auditorium and did for many many years uh, even after the new one was built until we had our first town hall but there would be recitals and 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 uh, choir singing and whatever uh, there. But um, whether they actually put a big lock on the front door or not, I don't know. I think those places usually were were open, but certainly there would be uh, town records and perhaps even town monies that would be locked up inside the place, and somebody had to be trusted to have the key 
and that person would open it probably with somebody else present to uh, make sure that he didn't uh, uh, filch a coin here and there. Okay. So uh, that was the key keeper was that was one of the town jobs. Yeah. Okay, great. Amanda, did you want to ask the next question or? Sure. Actually, I'm gonna, I think we have a question that is similar. So I'm gonna ask the audience question first. Okay, sure. Um, it says, one could argue that the most significant national event in 1820 was the Missouri Compromise, the first effort to address slavery since the ratification of the constitution. Did our forebears here in Darien engage much in that debate or did it just not engage um, us as much in slavery was almost non-existent here? I think the latter. Uh, I don't know. I try, I, I, uh, somebody was talking about this earlier and I tried, took a few minutes to try to, to look into some of the sources and some of the Connecticut books and things, whatever. I couldn't find a trace of anything about the uh, Compromise of 1820. Uh, and uh, the, the, the issue here, I think with slavery by 1820 was um, how do you properly care for the old slaves? Uh, you, can't, you can't turn them out. Uh, and what do you do? And now all of a sudden, instead of being your helper, you're, you, you've got to help them. Uh, but, uh, and there were very, very few. I don't think there were any slaves left in Darien by then. I know by the 1820 census, there was, um, I think two left in Stanford, none in Norwalk, uh, which is where we would have found ourselves. But anyway, um, no, actually, Darien has Darien census was Darien was a census town at that point. But anyway, there were none in Darien, um, and the ones that did exist were primarily live-in women who had been there probably for thirty years, uh, and and were now helping the old lady uh, get through. There was no new activity. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question. Yes. With the census, did they specifically like list slaves in the census? I'm sorry. How did they organize that in the census? How did they organize um, that information? Did they specifically uh, say slave? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did. They specifically asked for slaves uh, and uh, people of color. And um, then there were Indians, something else, something else, and all others, whatever those might be. Uh, there was another category and there was only one of them in town. Hmm. I'm curious. Ken, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't also the census um, a, a major research tool for you uh, for when you were oh, writing by this all means. Yeah, by all means. It was uh, it, that, and, uh, uh, that and the town tax rolls and a few other things that there was actually a uh, census of manufacturing was done fairly close to that time also. It was the, the U United States government's first census of manufacturing and that was, that kind of thing was pretty helpful too. But um, yeah, the census was, was really extremely important because one of the things that it showed was how the same names keep cropping up all, all the time. Uh, and uh, I think there were, what did we say, 209 households that uh, were enumerated in, the, uh, in that census. And, I believe, and 95 of them were named either Waterbury or Weed. Uh, and then there was another smaller cohort of, uh, of, uh, or of, of, of smaller families that still had six or eight uh, households with those, with those surnames. And so it was really still a tight little island. Right. Um, oh, I think it's my turn. Or should we take one from the... Um... I have an audience question that I, I'm curious about myself. Okay. What was the driving force for creating Darien as a town separate from Stanford and Norwalk? 
and there's a two-parter, was the name Darien adopted at that time or was it already being used to describe the area? I'm sorry, was the name what? Was, was the it, name Darien, was it adopted at that time or was it yeah. used to already to describe the area? It, it, it was adopted, the name Darien uh, is found in the State Assembly Act that was passed to create the town. So it was created with the town Darien name in it. It was actually a write over because uh, they had originally written, written in Belleville to uh, uh, honor Thaddeus Bell or figured that that would be a good, as good a name as any and Thaddeus took it out and wrote in Darien. Uh, and that's, that was what the, <clears throat> that was the bill that the government, the governor signed on May 30th, uh, 1820. Now, your, your other question was, your other part of it was, uh, what now? What was the driving force um, oh. for Darien, like to separate from Stanford and Norwalk? Oh, uh, everybody was doing it. Um, the, um, as the populations grew in these villages or hamlets that were part of the large towns, and if you go back to the Revolutionary War days, there were five towns in Fairfield County along the shore. And there was Stratford, Fairfield, Norwalk, Stanford, and Greenwich. And they went, I mean, Stratford was the, was the biggest, that uh, the northern boundary of, of uh, Stratford was Newtown. The western boundary of Stratford was Fairfield. And Fairfield went up almost as far and came over till it met Norwalk. And Norwalk's boundary was Stamford. I mean, so they were, they were very large towns and they would have several parishes in them. And those parishes really became communities and those parishes as communities would, uh, they finally got to the point where they, the, the, the children were adopting the parents basically. They were, they were, the, uh, they were the going, uh, they were the going concern and people found it inconvenient and unpleasant to have to travel all day to get to the town center, wherever that might happen to be. I mean, if you wanted to see the town clerk from where we're sitting now, you had to go to downtown Stamford uh, on foot or by horse, horseback, maybe if you were lucky enough to be able to do that. Uh, but it was, a, it was a real chore, it was a real haul. And some of the larger towns, it was far harder even than that. So there were several towns, many towns that, uh, uh, what was it? Five towns turned into 15 towns, basically. Well, and part of the reason, isn't it true, Ken, that um, it took so long for Darien to gain its independence is because Norwalk didn't want to let go of the Rowaton portion of Middlesex. And can you talk about the reasons why they didn't want to let, well, let that go? They've never admitted, uh, it's never, that's never been discussed. I mean, it's okay. been discussed, but it's never been told. Um, most of the towns that became, most of the parishes that turned into towns uh, were within the boundaries of a single larger town. And the ones that had to cross the town boundaries, well, they were usually so far out in the boondocks that it didn't matter, nobody really much cared. Uh, but right here, we were right smack in the middle of, of everything. Uh, and um, Stanford, uh, we, when we became Middlesex Parish, it started just this side of, of uh, the Neroten River and uh, went into Norwalk, crossed over into Norwalk, um, just to the other side of Flax Hill. And then it went on a straight, uh, a, a straight sort of north uh, North westerly line to the Canaan Parish line. So about a third of the town was in Norwalk and a half of the town was in, St was in Stanford. Well, start with one thing that, no that Norwalk and Stanford were constantly almost at war with each other. So that was not a great, you know, not a great start. Also, if we had wanted to be a town and include that part of Norwalk, that would have given us 
uh, all of Five Mile River and the settlements down there, uh, which were pretty productive and I think uh, pretty good uh, uh, asset to a city like Norwalk. And I think also when you get right down to it, you know, I'd, I'd said that about, you know, 40, 42% of the population was congregational and, and involved with mid, the uh, Middlesex um, uh, society. And I think a lot of Norwalk was not. And I think a lot of Norwalk really had no strong desire to become part of a congregational parish uh, that was, or part of a, a town that was run by a congregational parish. So I think they never really told, they never really told uh, Thaddeus Bell why they were refusing it. They just said no. And uh, after the first two tries, then the, the state assembly said, gee, gee, Mr. Bell, why don't you first get your ducks in a row and make sure Norwalk's on board before you bother us with this again. Uh, so it was not till 1820 that he could make that happen. Uh, um, can I ask a follow-up question? Um, or Amanda, is there one of, of the audience uh, that you want to get to? Sure. We just so you know, we are we're running close to the end of this, and I want to make sure that everyone's answers uh, questions get answered. Sure. If we don't make it to everyone's, do you mind if I email them to you no, after sure. this? Okay. Just want to make sure no one gets their hearts disappointed. Just pick out the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> Um, someone was curious um, if you could talk about the oldest house on the post road. Uh, that's not a good one. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, the reason I no, the reason I say that is that there is, um, I think it is probably it may very well be the oldest structure in town. I don't think it's as old as has been advertised uh, prior. It was always thought of as being a sixteen. 80s or 90s house, and I'm sure there was one there at that time, uh, but houses fell down and houses were ill-treated and uh, were not built as well as they are now in some cases, and uh, so houses were frequently replaced after 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years <clears throat> instead of like tw every 20 years like they are now. But anyway, um, the house that is there right now seems to be uh, a structure probably of 1740s, and it would be great if that if that house could be saved and if that house could be uh, reconditioned and whatever. Unfortunately, this is not an era where um, early houses and early house museums at, per se are very high on people's must-have list. So I don't know what's going to happen to it. Maggie would know more about that than I do, but. I'll have to drive by and take a look at this house. So um, I, I'd like to ask a quick question. It was something that came up in our book club when we um, were reading your book. Uh, there was a debate uh, in the book club about whether uh, it would be a good thing. So th I guess the last 200 years, there's been a debate about uh, the why Thaddeus Bell chose the name Darianne. And during the book club, uh, we said, you know, if there was ever a document found in our archives, uh, a letter that said, you know, I talked to Thaddeus the other day and he said he definitely chose Darianne. Would, would you like it if that happened? Or do you like um, to guess about, do you like the past, uh, past time of just um, thinking about it? I, yeah, I'd like that to happen as a matter of fact, because uh, first of all, it's always nice to, to, to have some, uh, some degree of certainty in, in all of this. And the other is that the, the list of, uh, of hypotheses continues to grow partly at my, uh, my responsibility, but, um, it's it's getting to the point now where it's getting a little awkward to uh, uh, lay out the table of all of the uh, uh, all of all of the uh, possibilities. Do you want to talk a little bit about your new theory? Yeah, I will. As a matter of fact, um, and I would. Uh, one of the things that's so exciting about the 1820s is that uh, the. The United States, that New England in particular, 
uh, rediscovered patriot patriotism, rediscovered their history, rediscovered the Revolutionary War, and in, in the mid 1820s, rediscovered the Revolutionary War veterans. And it 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 was something that had been under a blanket. It had been un, it had all been covered over by the Federalists after the Revolution, because people like Sam Adams knew exactly how easy it was to get people up in arms and get them into revolution. It was dead easy. And he had done it almost without thinking. And, uh, and we won the war and all of that stuff, but he didn't want anybody doing it again. And there had been Shays Rebellion and a couple of other incidents that led it to be, believe that it was still out there. These farmers still had guns and they still, still had attitude and they still had some opinions. So they, absolutely clamped a lid on anything. There were no more celebrations of the Boston Tea Party or the Boston Massacre or the, 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 the taxation uh, thing of, of 1765 that they used to have in Boston. That all went, it got rolled into the 4th of July celebrations. 4th of July celebration, they would have, they would sing some hymns and there would be a, there would be a, uh, uh, a there, were, there would be a, uh, 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 a sermon read, but they would not ever read the Declaration of Independence because that was far too inflammatory. So that was all off. And by the 1820s, that all came back because the, 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 the Republican government, the Jeffersonians, uh, were much more liberal on that and much more ready to recognize the value of it all. I mean, in, in uh, July 4th of uh, 1817, President Monroe went to Boston and consecrated the uh, field on which the Battle of Bunker Hill was fought. And that was, the first, there were 40,000 people showed up for that. And that was just like blew the lid off. And um, so it was then really that for the first time, uh, people began to value the uh, old revolution. And the Revolutionary War veterans still were for years and years and years now they were they were interested in all the revolutions going on around the world and in the Western Hemisphere, where all of these nations were suddenly becoming independent and kicking out the Spaniards and kicking out the uh, the Portuguese. And in August uh, of 1819, when they threw out the Spanish army, they beat, uh, Simon Bolivar beat the Spanish army in uh, the Battle of Boyaca, uh, and that all, including Darien which was Panama, uh, suddenly was, were free from Spain. And I think that that old Revolutionary War veteran uh, and the other Revolutionary War veterans were happy to choose a newly free country, uh, the name Darien, uh, which is a lovely name, and uh, assign that here. Many, many towns in New England had gotten newly freed names, uh, names of newly freed countries uh, to be their names, like towns like Mexico, Maine, and Peru, Maine, and places like that. So I think that we were just one of those. It's a good theory. It's not my favorite, but... Um... Well, it's not romantic, I know. I know. It's all... I, uh, so Amanda, how are we doing on time? Um... We have about 10 minutes left, unless everyone wants to stick around and talk more about this, because I would love to. <laughs> I have a few more questions I want to get to. Um, someone asked, today we value the waterfront of Darien for views, beaches, water sports, fine homes, and leisure in general. What was the socioeconomic nature of Darien waterfront areas 200 years ago? Uh, there was not, I mean, I think most of the fishing and lobstering and whatever that went on were basically for private use or there was some sale. I mean, we've got, right over here in one of these cases, we have somebody is paying off the uh, cabinet maker uh, in lobsters. Uh, so there was some, some commerce going on. 
but essentially, it, it, Long Island Sound was our highway. That's how you got places. And uh, every one of the merchants had a, uh, a sloop that would once a week uh, in season go into the markets in New York to sell the farm produce and to buy uh, manufactured stuff from uh, the, the uh, businesses in New York. Um, you don't find, I don't know of much recreation that had anything to do with the water or the beaches or whatever. Uh, and there was not a large commercial uh, fishing thing here, at least until we started the oyster business in Norwalk. But uh, uh, it, it, it was very hard to, to maintain that stuff. I mean, <clears throat> I, I remember one thing there was a, in 1819, there was a, um, a lawsuit and um, between the guy who owned the mill, uh, Daniel Gorham and uh, my idol, uh, uh, Selleck Jones, and uh, over a little piece of land, and they got a bunch of witnesses up to the, in the court, up to the court in Fairfield, and they were always well, they were saying, "Well, I remember that because I remember that barrel of mackerel. There was a barrel of mackerel that had gone bad, and boy, I'll never forget that." And this, the 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 house was about 10, 10 yards from that barrel of mackerel. I mean, that 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 became a landmark. So you you get the sense that that didn't happen very often. If it was that memorable, uh, uh, so is that where Holy Macro came from? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, and then a few more. Was there remaining Native um, American influences up to this time frame in the town or the county? I'm sorry, what? Sorry, I read that kind of funny. Um, was there remaining Native American influences up to this time frame in the town or the county? Not really. No, as uh, a matter of fact, there wasn't much really after the early, seven, very early 1700s. Mm -hmm. Very, very few. And um, the part of the issue there, of course, was that um, the populace tended to regard any remaining Native Americans that you'd find around, essentially lump them in with non-whites. And so there was a tremendous amount of mixing between the, uh, the, the black and the red races uh, so that uh, it all sort of became a jumble. Uh, but there wasn't really a, uh, a Native American uh, culture at all. There's, a, there's another question here. Um, it, were there uh, better parts of town, like more upscale parts of town in 1820 or um, more beaten down areas? I don't know about the beaten down areas. Uh, one of the things that, that we would have noticed that I did not bother to discuss, but, but uh, most of these houses were surrounded by trash. Not that, I mean, there wasn't a lot of trash because there wasn't a lot of stuff that 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 you threw out that was not uh, edible by something or somebody. But um, there were no dumps and there was no garbage or anything like that. So all of, a lot of them looked a little bit run down. There were houses that you know got built and never painted and and stuff like that. If you wanted, if you were looking, for, probably the nicest part of town was the landing, uh, where there were three of the uh, merchants uh, had their houses there. And they were the guys, they had all the money basically. But Selleck Jones built a house, which is still there. Uh, it, 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 it suffered a major renovation not too many years ago, but that's right down next to the landing. When you come down to the Rings End Road and you're almost down to the, where the little buildings are by the side of the road, there's a house off to your right, kind of down a little bit low. Uh, that's sort of sideways to uh, Rings End Road. That's a Selleck Jones house. And across the road from that on your left up on the hill, that was Daniel Gorham uh, built that during the Revolutionary War time. Uh, and he was the miller. And then you go across the bridge uh, to what is known, always been called the Bell Mansion. And, uh, and that was another of the, uh, the merchants at the landing. Uh, and so that was probably the, uh, uh, that was probably uptown. Okay. Can you tell us what the population of the town was in 1820? 
Eleven hundred and something. Eleven was eleven eleven sixty something, something like that. And two hundred and nine households. Now this is a few questions. That was the start of it. Um, can you tell us what? Uh, I know we kind of talked about a little bit about businesses, but they're curious. What were the business demographics of the town? Um, you know, we talked a lot about farms. Were they mostly farms? Were there businesses and trades to support the town's residents, or did residents need to go to surrounding towns for supplies? No, the supplies were here. Uh, it was enough to ask that you go down to the landing. Of course, from here you could go to Five Mile River and go to their landing too. Uh, but um, uh, what you did have in town was by 1820, uh, you had. Uh, 12 weavers. Now these weavers sometimes were also farmers, of course. A couple of them were women. Um, and there were, I think, 12 weavers who were, I don't know, it's in the book, I, I think 20 something, maybe 24 looms total, which is a lot for a little town. Uh, and many of these weavers, most of them kept an inventory of cloth. So people obviously were overproducing um, uh, they were overproducing yarn or whatever, you know, thread or yarn, whatever, uh, so that the, the, the weavers could be paid in that. And so they would maintain an inventory and they had, they, they all had inventories of wool and linen. And one of them, uh, Joseph Mather, um, who had three looms in addition to his farm. Uh, also had several hundred yards of cotton cloth. I doubt very much if they were weaving cotton cloth here, but it was a factory product by 1820, uh, printed, printed cotton cloth. And that was of course on its way to replacing linen for summer use. By any chance are any of those looms in the museum's collection? Um, I don't know specifically. Uh, I don't know what our oldest textiles are. Oh, I think Amanda asked about the loom. So we did, we did the have- The looms? No, yeah. no, 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 no. We- uh, <laughs> Wishful we, thinking. No, we just got rid of a loom, as a matter of fact, but it was a, it was a 20th century loom that was taking mm -hmm. up an enormous amount of room. <laughs> um, no, those those were commercial looms in a commercial, you know, people did not have looms in their houses unless they were weavers that were weaving for, I mean, by then, the, 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 this was much more commercial by then. Now, people were still spinning their own wool. They were still spinning probably much of their own linen, and that's fine. But stuff like the uh, the, the, the actual weaving and then the, uh, there were commercial fullers to smooth the cloth. Um, and uh, it was, it, it had really, it had one foot in the uh, industrial revolution, basically. There was, that was the, the major manufacturing in town probably was the looms, the weaving. We are just about, um, you know, it's time to wrap up. Maggie, do you have any other questions that we didn't get to? Uh, no, I think that that's about it. But if, if anybody's uh, interested in learning more, um, please do go on our website, make an appointment, give us a call here at the Museum of Darien. We love talking Darien history. And um, if you're lucky, you'll catch this guy who's here a lot. Um, so thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, we'd love uh, to make an appointment for a tour of the um, exhibition or to see the Bates Schofield House. Um, we, we love having guests. And um, Ken, thank you for this wonderful evening. Uh, it's been a lot of fun and your book thank is- Thank you, I, I enjoyed it. That's... Thank you so Great. much. I really appreciate your time tonight. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Thank now, you. Maggie, if anyone wanted to visit the museum, are you, do you have normal hours or how does that work yeah, these so days? We're open uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 11 to 4. And um, if you just visit our website, museumofdarien.org, you can uh, schedule an appointment or you can give us a call uh, here at the museum. Wonderful. Thank okay. you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Darien Library, too. This is wonderful. Thank you for hosting. Thank you.